Body. Um, I'm being billed as a consumer advocate, but I suppose I'd just like to share that I'm actually um, Professional Policy Officer at Council for Intellectual Disability in New South Wales. But I'm also the mother of a young woman with Down syndrome, um, and she is my teacher. She has had some mental health issues, but this isn't one of the ones that we're dealing with today. So I suppose I'm just going to give us a little bit of an idea and an introduction about um, Cheryl and Kyle, and I hope that people have had a chance to have a look at Kyle's story. Um, I suppose what I wanted to say about Kyle's story is that to draw people's attention to what Kyle wants. Um, he wants to stay out of trouble, he wants to sleep at night and be happy, and he wants to make and keep friends. And Kyle's mum, Cheryl, wants to know what's happening with her son she wants a clear diagnosis and treatment, especially appropriate to someone with an intellectual disability. She wants somewhere for him to live that's secure and safe, but, in, but also responsive. Um, she wants him to have somewhere to go for his employment and a chance in an ordinary life. Within that context, I suppose, some of the points that 
um, Kyle and Cheryl's story raised for me. Uh, that there's very little understanding about mental illness and people with intellectual disability um, amongst families and the people themselves, um, but also sometimes amongst disability support workers. It's very difficult for families and disability support workers to separate out what would be behaviour and what could be the initial signs of an intellectual disability. Um, and there's a great deal of fear that surrounds that as well. That is about um, families and carers in particular thinking, having had a life of discrimination, a lived history of dealing with the next onslaught of issues, and the person themselves living in a, a world that's not responsive to them, and, and experiencing often a history of discrimination without understanding <coughs> why. You can understand that as a mental health issue arises, that can be something that, again, frightens the person with intellectual disability and their families. And so, and they're already used to dealing with a large, uh, with a, um, a, a several of the systems to, that's trying to support them. And in that context, what I'd also like to say is that it's very important for people to realise that um, only about a third, uh, more than a third of people with disability don't have the support of significant others and carers. And according to the Productivity Commission, that proportion of people is actually growing. So while we are talking about the needs of the person and the concerns <coughs> of their family, there are significant numbers of people that don't have that kind of support. On to the next slide. Just wanting to also remind that Cheryl has been dealing with the uh, disability support for a long time, through school, through regular school support classes, through day programs and employment. Um, and that's not always an easy um, system to navigate. The system itself has many silos. So you are going from one to another. It's likely in, in Kyle's story as well that he's had significant health issues, medical health issues along the way. So Cheryl will have had to be negotiating several systems and those systems, as we all know, don't speak to each other well, except for the odd champion who tries to do that coordination. And sadly, the systems themselves don't lend to easy coordination. I suppose the, um, one of the things in Kyle's story that really absolutely impacts on me is that there are a whole pile of people in Kyle's life who are suspecting that something else is going on, but not able to raise it or not knowing where to take it. And being met with considerable hesitation and <coughs> that. And again, that's yet another barrier to trying to raise um, the idea of mental health issues. We also know that I'm sure Julian will say that um, the incidence of mental health issues amongst people with intellectual disabilities is quite significant. And that's something that when you have a child with a disability, particularly an emerging intellectual disability or developmental delay, that can be yet another frightening prospect to look forward to in early adulthood or adulthood. So I suppose my message in this first instance to mental health professionals, and it's a message that I have been giving to disability support workers for some time, is about raising awareness that mental health is also on the agenda for people with intellectual disability. And finding, accessing and diagnosing a mental health issue and then appropriately treating it will give the same outcomes that you could have amongst people without intellectual disabilities, thereby giving them a quality of life that they should be entitled to and that the family will be striving for. So I suppose um, one of the last, a couple of the last points on my second slide will be raising awareness. And I'd really like to um, implore the, uh, the people on the webinar that you could reach out 
to local care and networks and disability services. Explain about the issues and about how to engage with the local system. And that perhaps we can also facilitate that amongst disability support workers, many of whom are low paid, as you know, um, who may not be incredibly highly skilled and may not recognise some of the triggers that you as professionals would recognise. My second last point is about accessing the system, particularly by a carer or a worker. My advice would be providing a welcoming environment, um, affirming the, the question, is this something we have to concern? Clearly Cheryl has talked about it with her GP in the case study. And the, while the GP is, respo is responsive, um, Kyle is resistant to that. So there are many barriers and it takes a little longer. But understanding a person's existing non-health challenges and concerns can give a much closer and a much better bridge to that person with intellectual disability. And they will respond to that if they're spoken to directly in a way that acknowledges and validates them. And I suppose the last point would be to be flexible in treatment options and to coordinate with the essential non-health supports. You're all experts in the health system and the mental health system, but there are others where the family might be considering, <coughs> and Kyle himself, some elements of their lives that are absolutely critical that might not sit well with a planned treatment. And the more flexible that is, the more likely it is to respond. Um, I hope I'm not telling experts to suck eggs, but certainly that's been experience that I've had with many families. Um, two extra things before I close, Michael. Um, just in the um, case study, the case study talks about the New South Wales Department of Human Services. We have had an election recently and that should be the Department of Family and Community Services. But the particular agency is Aging, Disability and Home Care. I suppose to the last thing that I'd like to say is that disability workers struggle as much with the issues of mental health as um, mental health professionals. And I suppose what I'd like to say is that Cheryl, families and other families that I've spoken to um, are absolutely desperate to, to enter the system and to get the right support, knowing that the outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities will be as useful and as valued as the outcomes for people without intellectual disabilities. So I hope that's given us a bit of a, um, a scene setting, if you like, um, particularly using Cheryl and Kyle's story. But this is very representative of any families that speak to me with concern. So over to you, Michael, for the next speaker. Thank you very much, Christine. That was a, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, I think it's news to them that um, the parliament's change their names every time there's a change of government. That's right. Now we'll move on to the GP perspective uh, from Nick Lennox. Thank you, Michael, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I think one of the things that's following on from what Christine said is that there um, we should acknowledge that, in fact, the expert in this is probably, in my experience clinically, is actually talking to the, to the mother. And Cheryl's absolutely central. She's central to this case. But she's also, if you want to know who the real expert in Cole's life is, it's her mother. And in the 20 years I've been working in this area, if I want to find something out, I go to the family, even if they've been within disability services or whatever they're called, for many years. So, and, and from the, this case scenario, the, the main contact and the, uh, that the GP has is with the mother, and um, so I think in the, in what I've been described is in this case, there's a long-term relationship, and the GP can provide an enormous amount of support. And I think central to that is finding support to the mum and potentially to Kyle. But talking about mum first, obviously her mental health. She has uh, we know that she has a physical illness, um, and treating supporting her and referring her as appropriate for her physical illness will be crucial just to, just to start off with. Um, you're also, 
as I think almost every parent I see has in their head a story about the disability, a, a, an experience, and often an exhausting experience over a lot of time. In that story may be grief, and always, always, always in that story is their future concerns, which uh, has been highlighted in, in the text of the, of the case. And often at the end of the consultation or towards the end of the conversation, conversation I have with them, I talk about the future concerns and how they see the future. And there is some innovative work going on out there done by families for families. Um, in Queensland, where I'm based now, there's a group called Parent to Parent, for example, that run uh, are run by families and actually get together with families and talk about how you know, they provide networks for the, amongst friends for their child. So when they're not there, there's some uh, support for them. And I think it's, that's one of the things I often raise with people. And although this is not the first thing I'd raise, the other issue that it raises is the cause of the person's disability. And that's quite unclear in Cole's um, case. And although many people may see this as irrelevant, it's highly relevant and can be really, really important to the, to the, to the family and to the person. Most recently for me, it was diagnosing Redstone syndrome in somebody who was in their 30s. A very, very important bit of information for both their care and also the mother. Um, the, so dealing with the future concerns and interaction. And finally, probably the biggest role, or one of the big roles for general practice and certainly for specialist practice, I think, too, is to be a very strong advocate and an informed advocate within mental health, accessing mental health, or within disability services. And believe me, both of those systems, if you're outside them, seem equally opaque and difficult to negotiate. Not only do they change their names, everybody, every member of staff is acting in their role and you have to persist very strongly. So doing those things for the mother as best you can in terms of the uh, structures that you're allowed to within general practice, I think is absolutely crucial. Kyle, I think, is a much more difficult problem for the GP. And the reason that he's a difficult problem is because he's now unlikely to come. And it's very hard to have uh, great influence over people and try to assist people if they won't actually come and see you. Clearly, there's been a breakdown. Um, he, he's now, I think the words was quite seemingly quite suspicious of his GP. I think the word was something like out to get him or something like that. And clearly that may allude to what's going on psychiatrically with him, and I won't talk about that at any length because um, Julian's got to talk after me and I'd better leave him something to say. Um, but the other thing that's striking first up, and, and it's a, really a mantra from my doing a PhD thesis, was that context is awful. If you look at this man's case, he's in inappropriate accommodation. He doesn't have any meaningful activity in his life anymore. He's been, been, been lost. He has a social poverty. We hear nothing about human relationships. There's actually nothing really about his communication style. And usually behaviour, challenging behaviour, is about environments and it's about communication. And if somebody can't communicate their needs in the usual way, they find alternative strategies such as um, meeting people or getting surly or whatever to express their disquiet. And clearly from the mental health point of view as a GP, you'd be thinking about depression and psychosis and potentially a whole lot of other things, including, I think, um, a real risk in many of the people that I see of abuse. And finally, the thing that I've done a lot of work in is looking at the physical health here. It's very well known, in fact, Sydney studies from the North Shore of Sydney demonstrate that people with intellectual disabilities have five plus conditions each, half of which are unrecognised or poorly managed and often unrecognised. And it's certainly, certainly the work that we've done in Queensland that suggests that. There's nothing that rapidly comes to mind with this case except perhaps constipation, but he's almost certainly on some of those constipating drugs and um, it's very common in this population. But you know, dental care would be another thing, certainly unrecognised psychiatric disorders. Not being able to see or hear properly is, is absolutely a problem. Reflux esophagitis may be a problem as well. So there's a range of things, and we can talk about uh, there's health screening tools that have been uh, that I'll talk about later. Finally, the system perspective, and really it's just iterating the need that he needs an advocate, he needs a key person. Often this is the mother, but often they they, they need support, and there is at times professional advocacy organisations that will provide this support, and that will vary from state to state. And finally, um, an absolute need for a clear 
clear diagnosis as best we can, at least if you're providing a psychiatric assessment, provide a formulation with an, a notion of what your thoughts are about. I have to tell you, in the 20 years I've been in practice, I've really received a, a good formulation, and that's what we really need to progress. And I think I'll stop there, Michael, because I've talked long enough. Thanks. No, thank you very much, Nick. You, you can never talk enough. Always worthwhile listening to. Thank you. We'll now move on to um, to Keith. Keith McPhilly, a psychologist, is going to give us the psychologist's perspective. Over to you, Keith. Terrific. Thank you very much, Michael, and welcome everybody to our, our seminar tonight. Um, one of the things I'll warn you about, I've got a fair bit of detail on these slides and I anticipate that we might come back to a few of these as the, as the discussion goes on later this evening. So we're, we're not planning on a 12-week lecture tonight. Okay. The first thing that um, I'd, uh, I'd really like to draw people's attention to is Kyle. And I think there is a really important concept that we need to get our mind around, and that is of diagnostic overshadowing. And this is something that I think as healthcare professionals we need to be constantly vigilant for. All too often we see presentations and we see illnesses, we see conditions and we fail to see the person. And all too often with people with intellectual disability in particular, we attribute a lot to, oh, they've got an intellectual disability. This attribution, this false attribution of all that we see before us to a particular condition is what we refer to as diagnostic overshadowing. And I think to move beyond that, we need to make sure that we pay some really... We do need to see before us tonight a guy, 35 years of age, he's doing life pretty much on his own. He's separated from his family. He doesn't seem to have a girlfriend or a partner. He's living with a group of people and there doesn't seem to be much of, uh, much of a connection with the people he's living with. He's lost his job, and he's been given some form of alternative daytime recreation, which, which doesn't appear particularly in keeping with his past skills and abilities. And he doesn't seem all that well. There's a lot going on here, and, and I think maybe we can unpack some of that as we go through tonight. Um, to help us unpack, we can't just sort of storm in there and, and hope for the best. And I think this is one of the dangers as healthcare professionals. We quite often pick a piece that, that we feel confident with and we try and assess that bit of the person or that part of the person's circumstances and then we throw a couple of strategies that we've used before at it and, and hope for the best. I think in particularly working with people with complex disability, multiple and complex disability, we need to have a very systematic, evidence-based approach to what we do. And to help us with that, there are frameworks out there. To start with, I think it's really important that working in this area, we grasp hold of the notion of the social model of disability. Now, as healthcare professionals, we're very used to seeing disability as a pathology, as a dysfunction, as something that warrants intervention and cure. Well, I think it's really important that we also acknowledge that disability is also about a culture, it's about an identity, and it's about a way of being. So in one sense, what we might be doing with Kyle is certainly focusing on issues to do with his mental health and his behaviour and his skills and providing treatment there. But we also need to acknowledge that who he is is a man with intellectual disability. I think we need to make sure that we're across the contemporary frameworks that are offered by the World Health Organization and the like, and I think we've just moved to a slide there. And we need to understand the notion of the biopsychosocial model of disability. Later tonight, we might come back and talk about what the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disability offers us, and there's some resources on the website uh, that will take us to, uh, to places where we can find out more about these models. And we also need to be across person-centred approaches. 
these are areas where if you're not familiar with them at the moment, I think they will be well worthwhile following the seminar, spending some time, because these are the frameworks which will help us to assess Kyle and his circumstances, to formulate appropriate strategies, and then to evaluate the effectiveness of our intervention. When it comes to interventions, we have a vast array of uh, interventions available to us, and again, these are things that we can come back to later tonight to talk about. There might be specific questions. The Australian Psychological Society has recently issued a new set of guidelines on evidence-based interventions specifically aimed at the support of adults with intellectual disability, but which are also adaptable to working with children as well. And they include some of the interventions that we see on the slide in front of you tonight. The multi-element systemic interventions, some of the counterintuitive strategies, and going back to strategies like cognitive behavioural therapy could be very applicable here for a man of, of Kyle's presentation. Also, interestingly enough, there is a growing evidence base about the use of mindfulness techniques with people with intellectual and developmental disability. So there are a vast array of evidence-based, proven techniques. Quite often, these are techniques that we would use with any of our other clients. But it's about thinking through how we might adapt them to use with Kyle, a man who maybe has some cognitive limitations, maybe has some communication difficulties, but could still benefit from many of these evidence-based techniques. In terms of the assessment and formulation of, of what's going on here, I think as practitioners we need to think about some of the ethical issues. And as the conversation proceeds tonight, we might have a bit of a chat about issues of consent, the involvement of Kyle in providing consent to any program or intervention that comes about the involvement of Kyle's mother, or some of the limitations around the involvement of his parents, bearing in mind that Kyle is an adult. And as an adult, has the presumption that he can direct his own healthcare services unless otherwise established. That's not to say that we necessarily leave him on his own in these circumstances, but we need to first and foremost work from a perspective that we're working with Kyle and that there are limitations to what his mum and others can authorise by way of interventions. I think we need to have a good handle on Kyle's intellectual ability and that seems to be somewhat nebulous in the case study that we have before us tonight. And that's not uncommon. We've gone through a phase where we haven't been doing a lot of robust and rigorous assessments of people because we didn't want to put a label on them. But I think certainly as Nick was talking about tonight, it's really important to have a good handle on the diagnosis. And that might be a physical health diagnosis, it might be a mental health diagnosis, but it might also be rather important that we have a handle on Kyle's intellectual disability, both in terms of IQ as well as adaptive behaviour. And when it comes to working through these issues, as the slide before you now suggests, it's not about us as individual practitioners working on our own, trying to make it up as we go along. It's really important for a man like Kyle that there is a team behind him. And the, the slide in front of you at the moment suggests a number, of area, a number of areas of assessment and intervention and some suggestions as to where some of the various disciplines might come into play in this jigsaw puzzle that we need to put together when conducting assessments and designing and implementing interventions. And as you can see, there's a role there for the family. There's a role there for psychologists, for psychiatrists, nurses, physios, dietitians, speech pathologists, OTs, social workers. All of these disciplines have an important role to play. And so too, there is an important role to play for the direct support staff and the service managers who are involved with Kyle's home and with his day service. And as healthcare professionals, we need to work out how we can incorporate their wisdom, their knowledge, their skills and understanding into designing and implementing a program for Kyle. Okay. And I'm just clicking through to the next slide there. 
I think we need to make sure that when we're setting up goals for Kyle, that they are smart, that we don't just have very nebulous goals about we're going to fix his mental health problem, but we target specific issues to do with his health and his well-being and his quality of life. That we develop recording systems and have those in place we can't just rely on Kyle coming back to us to a weekly session and saying, how's it going, Kyle? We need to ensure that Kyle and those involved in his day-to-day -day support have some mechanism for recording his progress, some written documentation. His program is going to need to be written in some format because it's not just going to be Kyle who's going to be implementing his own program. In my experience, Kyle could have maybe 10, 15 people involved in implementing this program. So it's really important that they are all literally on the same page. It's not just about working with Kyle, but it is about delivering education and training to the staff who are working with him. And not just delivering training, but being prepared to go to Kyle's home if he's happy to have us there, go to Kyle's place of work during the day again if he is happy to have us there, and to model to the staff the strategies and the ways of providing support. As clinicians and as service providers, we need to also adopt the role of mentor and coach to those who are providing day-to-day -day support to Kyle. This is not just a relationship between you as a practitioner and Kyle, but it's a relationship amongst practitioners and Kyle. We need to be building capacity out there amongst those people who will journey with Kyle well beyond our involvement, and we need to support Kyle and those practitioners in a program of reflective practice. And at that point, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Keith. That was good. Now we're moving to uh, Julian Fuller, um, and Julian's going to give us the psychiatrist's perspective. Thank you very much, Michael, and it's a real pleasure to be here amongst such good company and especially to see that many of the questions already posed by participants uh, in tonight's webinar are really very thoughtful and are at the heart of uh, this provocative question of the interface between intellectual disability and, and mental disorders. It's especially heartening to see some names of uh, people I know who have tuned in tonight, and uh, I was watching the uh, the worm that is the attendance uh, number, and uh, I have to say that it's actually peaked during uh, Keith's presentation. So uh, we'll we'll try and maintain the uh, interest and the dynamics, and hope that we can uh, maintain all of you on board tonight. I think it's important to say that Kyle's situation is not uncommon. Mental illness is overrepresented in people with intellectual disability in the order of between two and a half to five times that of the general population. And so it's really good that we're focusing on this situation, Kyle as an adult. It's not one that's often addressed in educational settings, but one that's very close, uh, certainly to my heart and to the um, initiatives that we see happening uh, at a state and a national level to bring this area to uh, attention. A couple of things I would like to start uh, by exploring is to first consider that we need to make sense of uh, Kyle's presenting symptoms. Obviously the first task we have ahead of us is clarifying symptoms. Now this may be quite a difficult task given that he's not engaging with his general practitioner. But we need to understand some principles. The first of which is to understand that the, severity, that the presentation of mental illness in people with intellectual disability will vary according to the severity of intellectual disability and the communication skills of the person with intellectual disability. We need to gain some uh, strength and confidence from that in that it seems that Kyle has a mild intellectual disability and is probably able to interact with us in a way that uh, is quite familiar, uh, largely uh, verbally based. And so our assessment skills will be very similar to that that we might use in the general population but with some adaptations. So we can draw some 
uh, confidence, I think, that we come into this scenario as clinicians with at least a template of skills that will be adaptable to this setting. The second thing to say is that the current symptoms are, appear to me at first glance to be chronic. Most are fairly non-specific, and I think we need to explore them in depth to understand their full range and severity before concluding that what's in front of us is simply a plethora of behaviour behaviours that are built up over a period in response to environment. And so keeping an open mind about the possible presence of a mental disorder uh, is very important. The third point I think is that clarifying symptoms takes time and persistence and it may be that we need to spend longer in our assessment of an individual like Kyle and that we need to revisit the assessment at several time points and make sure that we explore all avenues. Considering the symptoms in context is also important in that we need to know what are Kyle's communication strengths and weaknesses. For example, it's fairly easy to misinterpret and appear paranoid if you, you uh, don't really understand uh, social norms and you misread nonverbal communications, especially emotional aspects of communication. And this would be a particular issue that arises in the context of autism or autistic spectrum disorders but could arise in any context uh, when intellectual disability is present in an individual. And the third thing I think to consider under this heading is uh, to consider what's happening in the background. Uh, I think uh, this has already been highlighted particularly by Nick but Kyle has had multiple moves, multiple dislocations, there may be a mismatch match with his current uh, day placement and with the type of care structure that he finds himself in. And so we need to understand the impact of these issues on his uh, mental health and on the behaviours that he's exhibiting. We need to prioritise investigations and by investigations I mean in the broadest context. Uh, we uh, need to have further inquiries and we need further sources, rich sources of information. We need to talk in detail to his mother. If we're not the general practitioner, we need to talk to his GP. We need to talk to staff at the group home. We need to access the information about the previous mental health assessments that have occurred. And we need to know directly from the workers at his day placement what they make of his symptoms in that setting and what has been happening in that setting for him. We also need to uh, perform a detailed assessment of Kyle. Now that may be difficult, particularly uh, given that he's paranoid or apparently concerned enough not to go to the GP. So we need to decide when do we involve the mental health team. And the urgency there might depend on the perception of risk. And we may need to um, involve uh, the general practitioner in providing advice on monitoring, uh, particularly to the family and staff in the group home and warning, warning signs or signs of concern that might actually escalate the urgency and mean that the plan to involve the mental health team might need to be um, uh, done more proactively and more urgently. An additional point uh, here I think is that an organic workup uh, may be necessary in this setting. Nick has highlighted the high rates of medical morbidities among people with intellectual disability so we need to make sure that we uh, don't have a hidden medical problem that's manifesting as a behavioural change. And a simple illustration, as with anyone in the general community, could be thyroid disorders. Either hypothyroid or hyperthyroidism can actually cause significant change in mental status and, and behaviour in people with intellectual disability. So we need to make sure that there's not a hidden medical problem, uh, a medical problem such as a chronic a pain, a pain uh, condition which might actually increase the likelihood of challenging behaviours or behaviours of concern. And of course we need to understand just as with the general population that uh, an organic workup looking at uh, causes or likely causes of psychosis might be in order. This is particularly important in people with mild levels of intellectual disability where we often overlook the things like a urinary drug screen to detect cannabis abuse but we must remember that people with borderline intellectual uh, abilities and in, uh, mild intellectual disabilities do have significant rates of substance abuse and this is one factor that might need to be evaluated along with others and we shouldn't hide uh, or shy away from uh, the investigations that need to be done and we might consider for example, it's, it's 
quite um, a first uh, a first line priority to complete a detailed organic workup in someone presenting with psychosis for the first time. Kyle should be afforded that, including, if necessary, a screening uh, imaging of the brain if it's concluded that he has significant psychosis, if he's cooperative. And that's, that's a point that can be discussed later. On to the specific issues. There is a strong interaction between the environment, behaviour and mental health. And we've heard already, or know already, that uh, Kyle is experiencing some difficulties in his environment. So we need to be able to integrate that into the formulation that uh, Nick was proposing. We need to also understand Kyle's symptoms in the context of uh, his life stage. He's a 35-year-old man. Uh, he is stuck in a setting in which he appears unhappy. It appears to be a poor match uh, with his own skills. He's with 20-year-olds who are requiring a much higher level of care. And he probably carries the weight of expectation upon him that he can't fulfil. We've heard a little bit of Cheryl's expectations that uh, unwittingly she may have um, uh, transferred to him. But uh, people in this setting feel an enormous weight of expectation and a sense of uh, failure at not having met many of them. And although the push uh, that we have in society to make sure that people with disabilities of all sorts are included uh, in the broader sense in, in society, this can also be a factor that actually creates a, a mismatch between the, the keenness um, of, of society to, to uh, allow contribution and the difficulty that a person with intellectual disability might have in, in actually fulfilling that to its fullest. Uh, and so I think um, we also need to understand that an additional uh, diagnosis of a mental disorder potentially carries with it additional disability that can actually magnify the difficulty uh, Kyle has in participation and engagement. And the final point in this slide is the sense that we need to tolerate ambiguity. Assessment may need to occur over a long period of time. We need to, may, may need to document long-term change. And deterioration, for example, uh, in the course of schizophrenia is quite typical. We need to see, um, has that, is there evidence that that's occurred so far? Is there, there evidence that occurs as time goes on? Uh, and we may, may need to uh, proceed with a medication trial um, at some point, even though all of the data is not in, especially if there are high risks to Kyle or to those around him. I'm not pushing that as a main point. I think it's a point for discussion. We don't really know enough about Kyle to know exactly what's going on with him. Then I think if, if we go to the uh, broader issues that I just wanted to highlight, I think engaging mental health services can be difficult. I spend a lot of my time uh, trying to work on that very issue. Uh, I think we have a uh, siloing of expertise that Christine highlighted in that our service structures, uh, particularly human services on one hand and health on another, don't necessarily lend themselves uh, to uh, creating an interaction that's to the intellectual disability in their families. Uh, we, these barriers are artificially created uh, by bureaucracies. We need to make sure that we're at every step of the way trying to make sure there's a rich interaction, that we understand one another's roles and responsibilities and the limitations of each of the services. We also ha have to have, I think, a fairly high expectation of mental health services. And I base my expectation of health services on the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And Article 25 within the UN Convention uh, says, really, that our, our um, aspirational goals should be that people with disabilities of all sorts should have uh, equal uh, participation uh, and, and access to a free and, and high quality health service. And that is, that is the goal. That should be the goal for public mental health services. And certainly public mental health services can't exclude people uh, on the basis of intellectual disability. We also must, as we're interacting with different services, avoid an us versus them mentality and avoid feeding into the antagonism that can develop when we're dealing with quite complex cases. And I think the final point I'd like to make is that support for family is, is uh, very important but can be quite limited. Uh, and I think more can be done uh, in terms of assistance with family, supporting families, education 
um, advocacy and, and collaboration between health and mental health uh, workforce um, and family-based carers. So I'd like to, to uh, stop at that point, I think, Michael. Thank you very much, Julian. That was, um, that was very illuminating. Thank you. And thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists. Um, it strikes me that um, of, the seven, of the webinars that I've been involved in, we probably had less questions tonight than any other webinar I've been involved in. And that's no reflection on the attendees. I think uh, many of the points that we, we as practitioners would want to raise um, have are being covered by the panelists, uh, and it's to their credit. We are now going to move to a question session where individual panelists will ask um, other panelists questions um, in the realm of their expertise. So I'd like to ask Keith first to ask a question. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. My first question tonight is directed to, to Christine, just to put you on the spot here. Um, in my presentation, I alluded to the need to look at some of the ethical issues when we're approaching our work with Kyle, uh, in our engagement with Kyle, in our assessment of Kyle and his circumstances, uh, and in the design and delivery of, of some form of support or in intervention program. Um, as an advocate, um, what do you see as some of the important ethical considerations here? And from the point of view of a parent, where do you see some of the points of leverage that you as a parent might have, but also some of the limitations uh, and maybe where a formal guardian might need to become involved? Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, it's a prickly question and not one that we have an easy answer. I suppose um, I was thrilled to hear about every speaker talking about the importance of the individual and their own individuality. And that absolutely warms my soul as a person who's an advocate. The ethical considerations are vast and numerous, but the ones that strike me first would be the, the um, having an agreement between the person themselves, Kyle, and the mum. Mum might be looking for a safe and contained environment where she no longer has to worry about some of the disturbing behaviour that Kyle's starting to uh, display. But I would say as an advocate, well, mother's needs and concerns do not overlay Kyle's um, human rights to be the person that he is. And safe should not be code for constrained or contained. I think many of the professional speakers also talked about how isolated Kyle is and how his life seems to have no joy or, or tap into his own uh, needs, wants, interests, attributes, talents. Um, another ethical consideration is whose needs are more important? Kyle, the person with intellectual disability, family who is generally much more, um, much more articulate, um, there must be a dignity of risk in being a person with an intellectual disability. People must be able to make their own decisions and in every single case, Kyle needs to be asked first. You need, you need to be talking to Kyle in every single case. I absolutely agree with you, Keith, and with you, Julian, um, and actually Nick, to say that the mother and other family members can be rich sources of information. But we start with Kyle, and that's where it, it, it goes. And what if Kyle, though, is suggesting things that are illegal or immoral, or he doesn't understand the consequence of his actions? Uh, that again is a difficult situation and depending on how the family is interacting, the health professional could decide that the family is not acting in the best interest. The disability support people could decide that the family is not acting in the best interest and there might be a need for a formal guardian at that point. At the moment in New South Wales, there's no need for a formal advocate, a formal guardian, until a decision needs to be made that could be challenged. So, as a parent, 
uh, for my own daughter. I think that um, I would be considered the significant other. Um, but I always ask her what she thinks. And where she can't be giving direct consent, I ask her anyway. That indicates that she has um, a say in the decision and she always contributes to it, even if it's not a completely legal uh, um, answer. One of the other things too is, whose standards are we meeting? And like the listeners and like the speakers and like people in society, people with intellectual disabilities have different needs and wants, have different lifestyles and different preferences. And as the previous speakers have said, they should be accounted. They should be accounted for. So there isn't one role for um, people with disability and ID, intellectual disability, and that's who they come. It's very different. And those kind of preferences and life life goals need to be very individual. Um, there will be a point, as I said, at which a guardian should be involved, and that could be where there is dissension between Kyle and his mother um, and there needs to be someone who is independent just on Kyle's side. Um, or it could be that there are other issues where there might be some suspicion about Cheryl's um, interactions with Kyle or someone else's interactions with Kyle or perhaps Cheryl's completely fed up and is worn out by the system and someone else needs to be on their side. Um, there's no right answer to that, Keith, but I hope I've given it a bit of flavour. Mm. Terrific. Thanks, Christine. That's, uh, that's good, actually. Um, please, thank you. We might just ask uh, Julian just to join us again um, and, to, um, and to ask um, a question of Nick. Yes, thank you very much. Nick, uh, one of my concerns, I guess, is with the role of the general practitioner in this setting. And I wondered if you could speak to a couple of things. One is uh, how, uh, what sort of information should the practitioner ideally communicate if making a referral to a psychiatrist or psychologist for a specialist assessment? And the other issue taps into more uh, preventive screening in this population because we've, we've been highlighting the high medical morbidity. What is the ideal um, role of the general practitioner and, and tools that the general practitioner might use in, the, in that thing? Thanks, Julian. Um, in terms of the re referral, um, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about, I think what, what the GP can absolutely provide is a longitudinal history over time because the, he's known this, uh, the family for a long period of time. So, and that's, that's gold in the management of, of any person, really. But you know, particularly when somebody in the intellectual disability field, where we have loss of information all the time. So, providing a longitudinal history. I think when I read the history, the bit that said about the behavioural issues were there during childhood. I thought, ah, okay, this is this is actually a really useful bit of information, and and they've got worse over the last couple of years. And I thought, well, okay, so, so there has something that happened in the last couple of years that gives me a bit of bit of context. So providing that that information, which may not be readily available, and um, I, and I guess specifically in this case, some of the information about possible paediatric involvement in childhood might have been useful. But then the usual things, the significant past history, um, the, the the family context information. Um, and how you see the presentation, having seen this person for the whole of his life, really. Um, you know, it, it, I, it's a challenge, I think, for GPs. And when we've surveyed, we did surveys of a thousand GPs across Australia, and you know, one of the issues for them is really time. And uh, writing a detailed referral letter is is challenging, but I, it's very the information is crucial for this population because it, it always gets lost. Um, to the second question in terms of health, we we have, um, for my sins over the last three, uh, 15 years, I've done th the three largest randomised control trials in the world on a health assessment tool called the CHAP tool, which tries to decrease some of the barriers to primary care. Um, and we have substantial RCT evidence now that this actually improves the delivery of health care. 
and has and is you know, some of the foundations for the health assessment items for GPs to do health assessment. So it tries to decrease the barriers, it gathers the story, it tells GPs these are things you're likely to be missing or that are not that well managed and it directs them to look at those things and interact with um, with the staff or the family, it encourages that interaction. So in terms of preventive health care, all of the people with intellectual disabilities in Australia now can get a health assessment, a comprehensive health assessment done by the GP. And further to that, that a lot of that can be done by a practice nurse if such a person exists within that practice. And I think that would be uh, even, uh, the, the ideal way to go. The only problem is that only about 50% of GPs actually have practice nurses and can't go on that. But it's some combination. Um, that's what the evidence shows, and I think that we that is clearly what best practice is in Australia and overseas, and the evidence is Australian and current. I certainly value the rich information received in referral, and it can be very helpful not only in the assessment but in planning management. And as for example, is that if I'm not aware of key medical comorbidities like uh, a reflux or uh, some other health issue that might be made worse by um, the psychotropic medications I might consider, yep. then I'm, I'm in the dark and I'm not, not necessarily as vigilant then in, in uh, um, assessing for side effects or mag magnification of that symptom. Whereas if I'm pre-warned, I can certainly involve the, the person with intellectual disability and their family in a discussion of the, the uh, issues or, or risks, things to look out for in terms of side effects. So, yeah, um, I certainly yeah. think it's a really helpful interaction uh, between the general practitioner and the uh, psychiatrist. Yeah, I, mean, I think the one of reflux is a really, really good point because it's often missed. And and according to the research, it's relatively common in this population. Even more than that, they more often have um, the Barrett's mucosa, so they're at a substantial risk, yes. particularly if they have immobility. Yes. Um, and, and constipation, as you know, a lot of the drugs that we would prescribe cause constipation or make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to, to just um, throw some questions to the panel um, and, and just feel free to answer them spontaneously. Um, the role of grief in the role of grief in the carer, the grief for for opportunity loss for the future, uh, concern about what would happen when, when the carer passes on and, and the, the uh, intellectually disabled person remains. Could you, could somebody address that to me? Dean, can I have a quick go? Yes. Um, if Kyle's 35, it's likely that Cheryl is 55 or between 55 and 65, and not yet old, but possibly terrified of the future, particularly as Kyle is wandering and Kyle is not clear about where what's going to happen to his future and there's no one that's taking a particular interest in Kyle's future. Um, speaking very personally, that's something that terrifies me because my own daughter is at home with me, despite the fact that we have set up services for people like my daughter to even be supported, but there are those who don't live in loving families who forever need to take up very few and sparse spots. So that's the understanding of the disability services sector. But I found in my talks to families that grief can be so exhausting and it does tend for some families to blur the lines in whose needs are being met by whatever strategies come up. And perhaps um, Keith and Julian and even Nick can, can say more about um, that interaction with the family. I think some of the most complex patients that uh, I've been involved with have been uh, the ones where the uh, family carer has been present uh, but elderly and becoming impaired in their carer role. And I think when someone is uh, a carer, uh, particularly when their cognitive or physical health is deteriorating and their care needs for themselves start to compete with their, their care needs and roles uh, for the person with intellectual disability, it becomes very complex. And the support systems around uh, that family need to be uh, not just complex, but uh, rich in their interaction with one another in order to adequately 
support uh, both mm -hmm. uh, or, or the whole the whole family. So I think that that has been the most complex, the most complex case I think I've seen, uh, particularly in the presence of severe and chronic mental illness in the person with intellectual disability and deteriorating cognitive function in the carer. Uh, I think it's an area that is increasingly encountered in clinical practice. People with intellectual disability are living longer, so the population stats for our general population are quite impressive and have got uh, government anxious about how we're going to meet uh, care needs of the elderly population in general, but the population of elderly with intellectual disability is also expanding quite rapidly with people from mild levels of intellectual disability approximating general community in terms of longevity. And so increasingly we're going to be have, having to address this quite complex area. I think that also raises the, the tension, the tension that all too often arises between providing holistic health care and acknowledging that holistic health care is about working with Kyle in the context of his family and in the context of the service that provides his accommodation as well as the day support service, but also working in a very person-centred and individualised way. That there will be times that we as health care providers can work with Kyle and his mum and the service provider and try to develop strategies across those various individuals. But sometimes there are going to be conflicts of interest. Sometimes individuals are going to have particular agendas that they need to have addressed. And I think at that point it's really important for us to decide who is our client and where is our primary focus going to be. And I noticed um, one or two of the uh, participants in a seminar tonight asked the question about why is Carl still seeing his mum's GP? Uh, and is there a role here? Um, for Carl to have his own GP, um, and I think that there, I think that's worthy of some reflection. To what extent do we provide holistic support to Kyle and his entire environment, his the whole ecosystem, and at what point do we actually parcel some of these issues up? And it might be that a, a doctor is is working with with Kyle to provide very personal treatment for a condition that mum gets to see uh, a, so, a social worker or a psychologist for some counselling, uh, that an occupational therapist is going to work specifically in a focused way with the day support service, and that each of those practitioners do work in a focused way, but at some point, and respecting Kyle's confidentiality and the privacy and confidentiality of others involved, that that team also has a mechanism of, of coming together and sharing that journey. Um, thank you. Um, may I just put a, a, a question, just, uh, just an accumulation of questions that I've seen coming through, and may I ask the panel just to introduce yourselves when you're answering the questions. Uh, not everybody has got an Irish accent, so um, is there a role for some organisation to care for this population, similar to Headspace, caring for... Um, caring for the adolescents and young adults between the ages of 12 and 24, because this population seems to be between two departments, um, and the experience of people being bumped from one, from one uh, department to another, or one group of therapists to another, whereas with Headspace you have GPs, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, um, social links, and um, job opportunities, ATODs all working together. Is there, is there any future, I mean, can you see a better integrated service for this population in the future? Would anybody like to comment on that? It's Christine here. Um, I, I work um, also with the New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability and a man named Jim Simpson with whom many of you would be familiar. Jim at the moment is advocating very strongly for multidisciplinary teams to deal with intellectual disabilities because it's so difficult for the health system to respond holistically as we've described um, to the needs of a person with an intellectual disability and also for that person to actually describe what's happening for them and to conceptualise um, how they're feeling. Um, that's something that National Council and various other 
advocacy bodies have taken up. So the multidisciplinary team approach, uh, which is being suggested should happen in every um, area health centre or health region, uh, is something that's being very heavily advocated at the moment and under what could be the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which will be providing, hopefully, a very much more individualised approach to responding to the support needs of people with disability. It's, it's Julian. Could I add to uh, Christine's statement? Um, I, I think uh, th there's quite a lot of thinking being done about service models for health uh, support needs of people with intellectual disability. It's fair to say that when you get practitioners in one room, you have a, a divergence of views, uh, and uh, it is an important thing that we, we uh, Come, come together. I think what's needed is probably increasing capacity within mainstream mental health services because uh, in the end it's private psychiatrists, private psychologists, community mental health teams that actually will do quite su a, a substantial amount of work in this area and will be able to meet, if appropriately skilled, be able to meet most of the needs of the population. But then there is a more complex group for whom more specialised care is necessary. And I think therein lies the importance of a multidisciplinary specialist health team. Uh, we're fortunate in New South Wales to be piloting one such team, and we have some funding from the health department here to pilot a, a comprehensive health team in the Illawarra and then assess its impact. But I really do think you need both uh, generic uh, capacity within generic services um, including within pr uh, primary health care and it, it certainly enhanced skills there and that's why uh, this sort of seminar is, is on today and then that very specialised uh, service that actually relates to and supports the work that's being done in primary care um, and in the uh, public and private health systems. Thank you very much everybody. Um, Nick, um, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask Julian or Keith? Yes, thank you. Um, ooh. I get a question for Keith, um, which is, uh, what is it that we, uh, disability providers, why do we end up with people ending um, in completely inappropriate residential settings. I've seen this time and time again and of all of us on this panel, I know that Keith has worked for a disability government disability service provider and to have a man who's verbal, got a mild intellectual disability, living in a house with three men that are non-verbal is obscene and absurd. Have you got any comment on your ex from your experience, Keith? I should I should make the comment here that I'm a clinical psychologist, not an organisational psychologist, uh, not, nor am I the minister. Um, I think one of the things that, that we have failed to successfully implement is uh, implement person-centred planning. Now, person-centred planning is the internationally accepted gold standard benchmark for the planning and support of people with intellectual disability. And, and person-centred planning is primarily about intensely listening to what people have to say about what is important in their own lives. And I think we have given lip service to person-centred planning and our government departments are, are not full of nasty, horrible people who are on the lookout to make people's lives a misery. Uh, they are to a great extent full of very committed professional people who are trying to do their best. But a lot of this comes down to to resource allocation as well. But, but I think that the way forward though is to become more focused on person-centred planning and also what's coming over the horizon with person-centred planning are individualised funding budgets which are going to be attached to individuals. So Kyle, in the not too distant future, will hopefully be supported by a service system where it's not money that is provided to a service provider and Kyle goes along and hopes for the best, but that Kyle will be provided with an individualised funding package and he can make some choices 
with the support of his family and, and the other advocates involved in his life as to where he will live and where he will work during the day. And I think once those individualised budgets and the person-centred planning processes are in place, Kyle and, uh, and people in his circumstances will be much better positioned to, uh, to make a life of, of quality to their choosing. Thank you very much. Um, Julian, you had a question to ask Christine around about awareness uh, of comorbidities. Uh, would you like to expand on that a little bit? Yes, I, I was just interested, Christine, in the uh, level of awareness of uh, carers, particularly family-based carers, but also um, uh, formal care providers, um, interested in, in mental health literacy in that context. It's, it's uh, been my experience that uh, there's a lack of awareness and that that is one factor that sometimes uh, uh, may, may have a bearing on access to mental health care for this group. It's, it's one factor among many, um, and I just wondered if you could comment on whether my perception is correct and then what we could potentially do uh, together to improve that situation. Um, that's certainly my... It's Christine here. That's certainly my um, very strong thing to family and talking to the service users, um, where when families are caring for, supporting people with uh, intellectual disabilities, then the idea of an emergency is really uh, confronting. Remembering that families who've dealt with intellectual disability might still have the prejudice and attach the old-fashioned stigma to mental health that many in the population still do. So there won't be a, a ready acceptance or tolerance of mental health issues just because you have an intellectual disability. So there could also be the stigma. Um, and people who are already dealing with a great deal of changing, a, um, a fragile web of support and an ever-changing medical and behavioural situation might just think that one more thing is too difficult to deal with. However, this is about the person, not the family. Um, so when we're talking, when I'm talking to families, um, I'm quite often gently raising the idea that if the premise of the convention on the UN Convention on the Rights um, says that a person with a disability should have a life that's reflected of a person without a disability of the same age, then basically we should be providing for family basically the same supports that people of the same age without disabilities, same supports and options for those people that you'd get if you didn't have an intellectual disability. And even that can be challenging for families. But remembering, as Keith has quite rightly said, this is about the person and we need to bring the families along. Um, your second part of that question, uh, Julian, was about what can we do together. I think talking about it openly, reducing the stigma, and I suppose um, using some of your um, uh, statistics, sad statistics on the incidence of, of mental health issues in a person with disability, uh, with intellectual disability, might start to soften the impact of the shock, but also might open people and families up to better treatment options, better approaches to the, um, to the mental health system. I think um, another hurdle though, quite rightly, um, I only use the word carer in relation to family and loved one type carer and worker in relation to people who volunteer or who are paid. Um, there is still that stigma and that, that judgment for many people work with people with disabilities, sadly. So again, that's another hurdle and it will take um, a lot more speaking, better quality management and um, staff um, access and education. But I think we just have to chip away at it. Hmm. I do agree though with Keith that with the oncoming individualisation of funding, 
that will be kicked along quite a lot because people with disabilities and families won't buy services that don't meet their needs. Mm. That will be a huge improvement. Mm, thank you. I think we obviously need to keep lobbying for improved edu uh, education and funding for educational efforts. And I know, obviously, there are many disability organisations and, and uh, uh, groups that are involved in that really important work. And, and you mentioned uh, CID, which I think is a very important one. Thank you. Michael might not be connected at the moment. Um, uh, can I make an observation while Michael gets reconnected? I mean, uh, there has been a recent Productivity Commission report looking at, and they basically suggest over eight billion be put in recurrently to get to respond to what they say. And yet, it's very strong words. They say the current disability support system is underfunded, unfair, fragmented, and inefficient. It gives people with disability little choice and no certainty of access to appropriate supports. And for a government document, that's pretty clear. Um, and I think you know the, the service models being moving towards delivering services that are that are attached to a person, so funding is attached to a person, and they go out and get services is one way. But there's a whole lot of other things in the health frame, and um, as uh, that are working in this area. And one of the potential real things that I, I'd highly encourage people to be involved in is the rollout of e-health mm. across Australia, because we have a fantastic fantastic opportunity for a lot of the information transfer that we don't get. You know, you know, clinically I often see people who I will have no story or very little story and it's very difficult to make judgments about what's going on. Um, extraordinary things such as um, seeing people who have had, uh, doing examination, discovering somebody's had a hysterectomy in the past that they can't tell us about and nobody knows about, and people have been trying to do pap smears on this, this person, this woman. And, and, you know, we see many, many, many of these stories. So, you know, encouraging using the e-health to try to, uh, to address some of the things I think is really important. And as um, uh, Christine mentioned, that CID, Council on Intellectual Disability, advocating for uh, inter, uh, multidisciplinary routines. And in fact, the National Doctors Association, which is called ADAM, Australian Association of Developmental Disability, has wor is working very closely with CID in that frame to go out to get that changes. Um, so, you know, and the, in terms of models of care, there's a number of models of care out there, uh, some of which are being tested as in Julian's model, in, and nobody knows really what is the best model of care. We clearly need really strong support from the mental health sector uh, and including both public and private because um, there's a, a range of mental health problems as there is physical health problems with this population. And I think I've talked long enough that Michael hasn't reappeared. Mm. There, there was a comment earlier about person-centred planning that came up that I will very briefly um, explore on. I think person-centred planning is something that is done very well in some parts of Australia. It isn't even heard of in other parts. Um, I think that the key to good person-centred planning is that we engage in listening to people. We don't come in as experts and as practitioners say, well, you need to learn some social skills and um, you need to lose a bit of weight um, and you need to get a bit more involved in the local community because we know as healthcare professionals that's good for you. That we need to do, if we're going to do good person-centred planning, we need to start from listening to the person. And, and very early on, um, there were some comments on, on the discussion list there that were emphasising the importance of finding out Kyle's existing talents and his existing interests um, and using those as, as a way of starting to develop some programs and supports. And oftentimes we as practitioners we go in and say, where are we going to start here? Um, and I think starting with, uh, with Carl's interests and his existing talents is, is going to be pretty we're important. Going to off, we're going to get cut off very, very shortly. Now, Michael's just back. Sorry, we're going to get cut off very, very shortly. I'd like to thank everybody tonight for their input. I could personally listen to this for another hour, but unfortunately time is against us. Um, if you wish to continue the conversation, um, it is possible to do so at the mhbn.org.au site. I would like to thank all of the, all of the panel, um, particularly for their input tonight. I certainly learned a lot. I would like to thank all the attendees. 
thank you very much, one and all, for attending tonight. And I look forward to seeing you all again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.